anybody black out there who gets this question about Irish slavery, Dr. Darity, could you once and for all, if I was a white man just asking this question, well, what about Irish? The Irish were slaves. Without you, without cursing me out, because I don't think you use that type of language anyway. What would, <laughs> how would you put me in my place? People, listen closely to Dr. Darity on this response. Hey, folks, how you doing? My name is Tim Black. Welcome back to another great segment of the show. I have a great guest. He is the uh, Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African American Studies and Economics, and the director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. He served as chair of the Department of African and African American Studies, was the founding director of the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality at Duke. He's that and so many other things. My friend, Dr. Sandy Darity. Hey, Doc, how you doing? Fine, thanks. How are you? Thanks for having me on the show again. Well, absolutely, sir. It's a privilege to have you, and we're glad that you accepted the invitation. There's so much going on. I just want to jump into it, Doc. We were talking off camera, folks, and I said, Doctor, right now seems like a great time for these conversations because even white folks are paying attention to what's going on with black folks right now. Yeah, it's uh, it's a different moment from uh, any that I've experienced. Uh, but, you know, because of a lot of the work that I've been doing recently uh, with Kirsten Mullen in our book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, uh, a lot of our work has been focused specifically on reparations. And uh, I don't think I've ever observed a moment in my lifetime where uh, national attention was drawn to reparations in the way that it is now, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's ever I've ever seen any any moment like this before. Uh, and and I must say that uh, the the transition to people having a conversation about reparations as something to be treated seriously actually took place before the COVID nineteen crisis. And before the uprisings that were associated with uh, with with the murder of George Floyd, because I I never had seen a set of conditions like the ones that existed last year, uh, 2019, uh, where you actually had credible political candidates actually utter the term reparations. Uh, and so uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going on entirely. Uh, but uh, I think that there is some recognition that uh, there is a debt that has never been paid, hasn't been paid for 155 years, and that the failure to pay that debt has had all types of repercussions for inequities, uh, lack of opportunity, disadvantages, greater uh, exposure to, to death, on the part of Black Americans today, um, particularly Black Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States, uh, there seems to be greater recognition that that's, that's a debt that needs to be paid finally. Uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very different moment. Do you think it's George Floyd, the filming of the police brutality, and people connecting the dots, or you think it's more just a political a move or, or a, you know, political situation. If I know that Marianne Williamson, she attended an ADOS meeting um, where she discussed it and she was supportive of it. I think it's it's a combination, but but when when you say a political situation, I yeah. assume you're meaning that there's some expediency on somebody's yeah, part. Yeah, like like I think. Okay, I'll just be straight, simple, yeah. and plain. I think that some folks were using the term reparations because they were basically caught off guard and had to respond. And some of the responses really aren't reparations. Uh, some people talking about things that really aren't reparations. When I think reparations, I think money or land, ownership, something that kind of like rights the ship and kind of makes us, will never be whole, but at least tries to make us whole, as if we were participants and actual citizens who were wronged in this country. So I, I think that sometimes that they're just, they're just saying things, doctor, like they're not really, they're saying it for political points, expediency, like you just stated. Yeah, I, I, except I, I would say this, that I think that the candidates who first started talking about reparations in 2019 
uh, were doing so in a climate where it was not at all clear that there was any advantage for them doing so. Uh, and in particular, I would would highlight uh, Marion Williamson, uh, who, uh, who eventually had a conversation, I think, with uh, Antonio Moore, our Tone Talks. Yes. Uh, over uh, the question of reparations specifically for, for the Eidos community. Uh, but she actually had been talking about reparations for many years uh, in some of her written work. Wow, I had uh, no idea. So, yeah. yeah, so she, she was not really a newcomer to the conversation about reparations. And she's the only candidate who really tried to push the issue on the debate stage. Uh, and it's interesting to note that when she did, uh, Kamala Harris shifted the conversation to school desegregation mm. yeah, almost immediately. Uh, but um, I, I think that the weakness in Marianne Williamson's position was that she was willing to offer uh, a, a, an estimate of a monetary amount for a reparations bill. And I think it got as high as $500 billion for her. Uh, but from my perspective, that's that's far off the mark mm. in terms of what the amount should be. And so that that's my primary criticism of her position. But uh, but I think she was uh, she was coming forward without any ulterior motives, except her longstanding belief that this is the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I totally, who, I totally agree. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I agree with that exactly. I was, I, I met everyone else <laughs> besides. Oh Murray. yeah, no, well, well, yeah, yeah. I'm going to come to everyone else. <laughs> the the other person who I think uh, came forward in an authentic way was Julian Castro, mm. uh, because very early in the campaign he said, uh, you know, this 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 made complete sense, uh, but he didn't have any detailed plan. And then there was only one other candidate who actually explicitly endorsed reparations. And that was uh, a little bit later, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit later in the campaign season. It was Tom Steyer who emerged. And that was a central point that he was making. But again, there were no specifics about what a reparations project should look like. Uh, virtually all of the others essentially endorsed uh the legislation that had been introduced many years ago by John Conyers to establish a commission mm -hmm. to study reparations and to advance proposals for reparations to Congress uh, under the under the rubric of H.R. 40. Okay. And, uh, you know, fairly early in 2019, it became clear that Nancy Pelosi, who had said that she might support H.R. 40, was giving the candidates a signal that that was the safest way they could address the reparations, uh, the reparations question. And, uh, and, and virtually all of them did follow through and saying, you know, the Democratic candidates anyway, that they, they were in support of, uh, of HR 40. Um, there's, uh, I don't know how far, how deep a dive you want to take, but there's some really serious problems with HR 40. Uh, and uh, I and I don't think it's it's a good pathway to reparations for Black American descendants of slavery unless it's revised or or replaced. Uh, well, but, not to but, get too far into the weeds, are there a couple things that you think uh, if you if you had to point like you know a couple things that really jump out to you about HR forty that that you because I know you wanted to set up your own commission and have a whole new board and 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 have uh, folks who are. Uh, more hand picked to uh, have expertise in that area uh, in charge of putting that commission together. I know that well, was. Well, I, I don't want to set up my own commission. I do have a research team. That's it. Uh, of yes. scholars called the Reparations Planning Committee. There you go. And yeah. and we are we are in the process of trying to generate a report that would provide a uh, a detailed plan for how you might undertake a reparations plan. Okay. Uh, we you know. We're actually playing off of or extending in a, in a, in a very dramatic way, uh, the ideas that, that Kirsten Mullen and I, uh, present in the final chapter of From Here to Equality, where we try to advance, uh, a, 
a, a scheme for uh, conducting an actual reparations project. Uh, but the, the reparations planning committee would is, is in the process of trying to generate a report of its own. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, I'm not presumptuous enough to think that I should have responsibility for well, yeah, yeah, appointing yeah. a congressional committee. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the issues that okay. there are, are a, a couple of organizations that do uh, presume that they should be responsible for uh, for the design and development of the congressional committees. Uh, and I'll be glad to talk about that if, 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 if you'd like. Amazing. Uh, I, I tell you, uh, the, like, like we were, uh, I was talking to my wife about this earlier today and I was saying that, uh, it's unfortunate that we have folks, um, we we'll listen to some black radio, Kathy Hughes morning show on the way out. I had to get a new microphone so I could do this interview today. And I was listening to the political bent that they were expressing on the radio. And I was like, you know, when I listen to white stations, I don't hear uh, the host of the disc jockeys um, trying to push all of white people a certain direction politically. And, and it, to me, it didn't seem like there was any political acumen, any political knowledge, just, you know, we need this. or you know, just just very broad strokes, basically vote Democrat and keep your head down and get rid of Trump. That's the way it sounded. Um, so so. And, and, and from your opinion, sir, is that part of why it's been so hard for us to get traction with reparations and not just reparations, but actual policies that uh, that would impact us favorably? Yeah, I think it's it's in large measure because uh, the Republican Party really does not provide an option for us. But uh, as a consequence, you know, frequently the Democratic Party operates as if our vote is something to be taken for granted and uh, makes no commitment That's to uh, the interest of the black community. Uh, what, what's, what's the line that uh, Yvette Carnell always uses, that, you know, uh, politics is an exchange. Mm. And, and we, we simply don't really get very much in exchange for the kind of loyalty that we have displayed. But, but, but uh, doctor, and, not to cut you off, sir, but that, you just said something I've never heard said, and I've watched a lot of content. You didn't just blame black folks for voting Democrat. You said the Republican Party doesn't offer us an option. No, they don't. I mean, the Republican Party for many, many years now has long uh, been the party of Strom Thurmond, not the party of Abraham Lincoln, mm. and uh, it it doesn't it, it's not a it's not a viable option for you to vote for uh, a bunch of overt racists, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. uh, uh, especially overt racists who are promoting a very very dangerous climate, a climate that is reminiscent of the conditions that are associated with the waves of white massacres that took place uh, from the end of the Civil War until the 1940s. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a very dangerous time with respect to uh, armed militias of whites and the kind of encouragement that they're receiving. I mean, how do you vote for a political party that has leadership that promotes that kind of behavior? Um, so, yeah, we're... we're you know, it, it, it's back to that whole game of supporting the least of the two evils. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the evils is so intensely bad that the uh, the sheer mediocrity of the other side seems to look better. Uh, but this is really unfortunate uh, because, uh, you know, we, we ultimately gain nothing from it's true. the process. It's very true. And... and uh... And, and uh, instead, we kind of turn on one another. It, it, until this election, I I was of the mind that we got to vote. You have to vote. You must vote. And I and I, you know, had some harsh words for people saying, you know, we should hold our vote. Now I've changed my mind. I'm not going to vote shame or uh, vote hotep, vote tep. Anyone who decides they don't want to vote, I would like to encourage people to vote down ticket. There there's some people locally that you might want to support, but as for the you know, the top of the ticket, if, if you feel that you can't find anybody to represent you, who am I to say that, you know, I, I understand your pain. I get it. 
I think it's I think it's critical that we vote and I especially vote for offices below the presidency, including very high offices. I mean, it's critical that we vote for the senators. Yes. Uh, the United States Senate. Uh, so, yeah. And, and I think it's the neglect of the down ballot positions that made it possible for uh, there to be this wave of red legislatures across the country's states. Um, you know, I'm in a, the state of North Carolina, which has a red leg, red legislature, and uh, uh, it, it, it's awful. And it's particularly awful in terms of what type of response you get in the midst of a, a coronavirus crisis, uh, where uh, there's a tremendous resistance to, to putting resources in people's hands at a point where uh, where folks' economic situations are quite desperate. So, um, so yeah, I think definitely people need to vote, and I think they must vote uh, in an attentive way uh, to every position from their local judgeships or county commissioners up through the Senate. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell them not to vote for the presidency, but I will understand if people choose not to do that. But I think it's imperative that they vote for all the other positions on the ballot. Absolutely, I 100 percent agree. And I, I've been, I've been, I've been getting better on this issue. My, you know, pre- speaking personally, I've been getting better on this issue uh, because just being raised as someone who thought, you know, you know, you know the lines, doctor. You know, people died for us to vote, and it's. It's it's a privilege. Um, it's a it's a right of a U.S. citizen. We need to take a, you know take advantage of those rights. Um, I, I, I don't but know if you heard of also yeah. in having a right, it's a choice. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's a choice. Okay, I mean, we we're not in a society where we are forced to vote mm. or penalized. Not okay. if you don't vote. Like or some penalized other countries. for not voting, not at least not penalized uh, by this by by any kind of governmental fee or the like. Uh, but we are in a society where there has been a long history, and there continues to be uh, an effort to suppress our vote, and that's something that we we need to uh, we need to continue to fight and. Uh, and that may be the stronger reason that I would give for uh, encouraging people to make the choice to vote mm. is because there is there is so much resistance in the present moment to our voting. And there's a recognition, I think, on the part of, uh, uh, of, of, of many folks who are out there competing in the electoral uh, arena that if we don't vote, it will not just have an effect on the presidential election, but it will have an effect, an adverse effect, in my way of thinking, on on the uh, on the on the down ballot positions. Right. And it would be more likely to restore uh, red legislatures across the United States, uh, and that's something that's really, really uh, has has been really, really dangerous. You know, when you you know, as we. Listen to that and think about that circumstance of the condition of voting and voter suppression in the United States. And you juxtapose it with what other countries, some other countries where you get penalized if you don't vote. Right. It kind of right. makes it kind of crystal clear what's going on here. I mean, people here get penalized for voting. People, That's there right. was a sister who got locked up for voting because she didn't realize that her voting rights had been taken away. So that's a different a polar opposite to what most other westernized countries and how they treat voting. Yeah, we still have so many states where uh, there are rules that restrict uh, the capacity of individuals who've been incarcerated from yeah. voting. And, uh, you know, since we have mass incarceration that's been directed disproportionately at black folks in the United States, particularly black men, uh, then it, it removes them from the electorate. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, and this is, this is uh, you know, this is intentional. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. When you spoke about red legislator, I meant to ask you, uh, could you break that down for me and other folks who might not understand exactly what that is? So when I say red legislatures, I mean legislatures at the state or municipal level that are controlled or dominated by the Republican Party, but particularly, more specifically, the uh, the, the wing of the Republican Party 
that's associated with what we have called the Tea Party. Mm. So it's Tea Party Republicans who I'm talking about when I talk about red legislatures. Uh, you know, to the extent that they control the state government or to the extent that they control the local government, uh, you know, the consequences have, from my perspective have been pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, I was I was looking at that as well. And also something that I think most people don't focus on and they should is the number of conservative judges that Donald Trump has infused, has installed across the country in states. Uh, he has set records in the number of appointees of these conservative judges. And I think those will definitely negatively negatively impact um, folks, particularly black folks. I mean, yeah, and to uh, the extent that these these folks are comparatively young, uh, it mm. means that there's a long-term effect of their, their appointments. Lifetime appointments. Yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation, Dr. Darity, is, you know, Ice Cube, famous rapper, he recently put out a, a, a contract or a, I, I, I don't know what, we, what he would call it, I forget the exact term he used, um, for Black America, a contract for Black America uh, that he wants, he wants white America or United States of America to get on board with. And there are like several pillars of that contract. It's, it's short of reparations, but it's very definitive items that he felt policy-wise that need to be implemented if black folks are to have an opportunity to, to build wealth and, and compete. And actually, as Yvette might say, survive. Because we're talking about survival at this point. Um, I don't know if you had the opportunity to look at it, but are there some policies short of reparations that you think we should be building momentum behind it and supporting in your work? I know you cover some some issues. I um, am, you know, there are a couple of things that come to mind. One is uh, Malcolm X's famous quotation about and you know, somebody who's had a knife plunged into their back. And uh, he talks about, uh, you know, it being pulled out six inches, then it being pulled all the way out. And, and he, he says that, you know, obviously that's, that's, that's desirable rel, rel, relative to having it in your back. But he says it's not the same as healing the wound. Mm. And I think many of the policies that people are, are, are putting under the label of reparations are more a matter of pulling the knife out than healing the wound. And so when I think about reparations, I think about reparations as, uh, as healing the wound, uh, and uh, and very specifically, I think that the, that wound has to be healed by addressing uh, the enormous racial wealth gap that exists in the United States, uh, to the tune of uh, a situation where Black Americans are 13 percent of the U.S. population, but only have about 2.5 percent of the nation's wealth. And I think that, that that share of the nation's wealth needs to be brought into proportion with the black share of the population, at least. Uh, and that should be a primary target of a, of a reparations project. Uh, and, and that's what's a, re, a prerequisite for moving in the direction of, of healing the wound. Uh, I think that a lot of the items that are on... Uh, on, on Ice Cube's contract or more a matter of, uh, of pulling the knife out, mm. which is essential, but uh, then they are of, of healing the wound. And so I don't really see the contract for America at this, at this time, uh, including a, a true effort to achieve reparation. No. no. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, there, there are lots of things that are on that, on that itemized list that I think are things that are, 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 are quite desirable to do. Uh, I do have one reservation, though, about the way in which uh, the contract is framed, because I think uh, at the outset, there's a, a description of a set of responsibilities that black people have to fulfill. And uh, I think, unfortunately, the way that is worded, it plays into the notion that black people are in some way responsible for the kind of conditions that we are confronted with, that it's a consequence of our own behavior. And, uh, and, and, and that, that section of the contract says 
but we have to make a commitment to change our behavior. Uh, and I think that much of our behavior is actually uh, actions that we take as a consequence of the conditions that we are faced with. And if we really want to talk about changing things, we've got to change those conditions rather than uh, change the way in which black people behave. In fact, I would argue that it's fairly remarkable uh, that we have managed this degree of survival under these circumstances to the point where, you know, actually people talk about black people lacking motivation. Uh, in fact, if you look at the evidence, uh, young black people from a home with a similar level of income as a white home actually get more years of schooling mm. and more credentials than their white peers. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I've never been fully, I've never fully understood, you know, people say black people are anti-education or they're unmotivated. Uh, it's not really consistent with my personal observation, but you know, I want to go beyond anecdote. It's not evident at all in the types of data that we normally look at. Yeah, I, I recently was had a phone call who had a similar statement. You know, the same old, I'm sure you heard it. Well, you know, black people can do anything they want to do. Look at, look at Obama. You could be president. And uh, just like just pulling things out of thin air just that don't apply. Yeah, you know, you mean, so um, they don't make any tangible so I brought up the fact that, you know, well, black women are very educated as a group, as a subgroup, very educated, with most education of than any other group in the United States. So if not, if not correct about this, correct me, doctor, but that's now, my understanding. Uh, they're, they're not the most educated, but they have the highest rate of increase in educational. That's thing. what it is. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 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 And I, but they de definitely have the most school debt. So that yes. we do know. Yeah. For trying yeah, to ascend yeah. that ladder, trying to to better themselves, and 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 we know that there's discrimination, in hiring practices, everything from if your name sounds too black to what your zip code is. This all exists. There's data, ex, you know, exposing all of that. But still, uh, this I think it's a, a lack of knowledge. I, I would like to hope that some of people just lack knowledge and information is why they they, they rely on stereotypes. And BS. Yeah, well, I, I was going to add, you know, you make an excellent point about uh, the issue of student debt. Uh, student debt in the black community is actually another indicator of the high degree of motivation to try to pursue educational attainment. Uh, we don't have the same kinds of resources to pay for education, but yet people are still doing their best to try to uh, obtain additional education. Uh, and, and we found some evidence in one of the studies that we did uh, at, at the Cook Center. Uh, we found that uh, black parents uh, who provide support for their sons and daughters' higher education have uh, about uh, one third of the net worth at the median of white parents who provide nothing for their sons and daughters' education. So this is a classic case of us doing more with less. And, uh, you know, I, I think it would be, uh, you know, I, I think we should free our imaginations to think about how much more we could accomplish if we had the kinds of resources uh, that, uh, that might be associated with what a reparations project should give us. You know, I'm getting the distinct feeling that you believe that if we get this bite at the apple, maybe we should take the biggest bite possible as opposed to what we think will be, you know, uh, I don't know, which will have least resistance. Like if yeah. we only get one yeah. shot, maybe maybe we should load up and, and make it a shot that really counts if we want to slay the dragon, so to speak. Well, and if you if you settle for less, you'll never get what you deserve. True, true. Well, well, well Doc, people, people I, will say, yeah. well, you, you got it. It's been done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, you got what you wanted. You got Barack. Look at I'm still hearing about that. You got Barack. It's eight years ago. You got Barack. No, no mind that he you know, had a white mom. It's from Hawaii and went to Harvard and law school and, and, and you know and uh, well, and, but I th I think more important is the question of what policies did he support. Oh, yeah. Okay, and and I think that's the key issue. And uh, the problem is, of course, that uh, that he had a playbook that said. 
uh, I'm not going to do anything specifically for black people that amounts to providing them with a significant amount of additional resources. Uh, the only project that I think he took up that was supposed to be black specific in some way was my brother's keeper. Uh, and, and that was predicated on a view that you are, uh, you're correcting the, the, the flaws in young black men yeah. as opposed to correcting the flaws in the conditions that they're faced with. And so, uh, so that, that to me is, is my complaint is actually, about not not so much about his his personal ancestry et cetera right it's a question of what what he was in favor of doing, and he was not in favor of doing the sorts of things that I think really would have improved the lives of black people in the united states and and it furthers the pathology this idea that there's something pathological about black folks as opposed to the environments as you just stated. <clears throat> the environments that you're raised in, the lack of resources, the bad schools, lack of job opportunities, all these things combine together to, to get this mix that we find ourselves in as opposed to it's something innate in black men that uh, particularly that that makes us um, unable to achieve. He played right and, and into still, that. And uh, still, you know, despite all of that, uh, you know, as I pointed out, for a given level of income in your household, we get more years of schooling and we earn more credentials than uh, comparably situated white folks. That's uh, it's undeniable, undeniably interesting, and, and something. You know, that's the thing, Doctor. We don't have we don't have Doctor Dirty on MSNBC giving people real information, real knowledge. We have we have people who kind of who just read that teleprompter and just uh, just go. Um, <laughs> I don't know well, that's what they do. No, they just they just read the television. Never was on the thing. And they worry about self. They don't worry about the collective. This, you know, they, they just it's like they just worried about uh, what what they can get and if they're going to be okay. Instead of they worry about doing good instead of you know doing well for others. They were they worry about living well instead of doing good for the collective. Is has been what I've seen. So. Uh, and that's just a statement. You don't have to respond to that. Doc, you wrote a new you wrote you wrote a new book. Am I correct about this? Yes. So the book is an attempt to it's it's actually a labor of love. Uh, this is a book that we wrote for the purposes of trying to make the case for reparations for Black American descendants of uh, chattel, U.S. chattel slavery. And uh, it's also uh, unique insofar as the final chapter is an attempt to elaborate on how you might actually conduct a reparations project. Uh, but uh, some things that I think are distinctive about the book is, first of all, we make the case for reparations not just on the basis of the, the horrors of slavery, but also uh, we make the case on the basis of the harms and damages that were associated with nearly a century of, uh, uh, of legal segregation in the United States, coupled with white mob violence that occurred on a continuous basis that took black lives and destroyed or appropriated black property. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of people don't recognize that since the United States was formed in 1776, the years of the Black Codes and legal segregation actually were longer than the years of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also say that you have to include uh, on, your, uh, on your bill of particulars for reparations, you have to include the atrocities that have occurred since the passage of the Civil Rights Act. This would include mass incarceration. It would include uh, police executions of unarmed blacks. Mm. It would include uh, discrimination in housing, credit, and employment markets. Mm. And then, of course, it must include the enormous racial wealth differential that we observe and that, that we argue in the book is the is the uh, is the gap that has to be bridged by a reparations project? I, I'd say the other third um, third major theme in the book is the notion that the United States has had a number of opportunities to become a society 
that was fully inclusive of Black Americans as citizens with comprehensive rights. Uh, but at every crossroad where that opportunity was uh, was available, uh, the wrong decision was made. The, the wrong fork was taken in the road. Uh, and, and we start with an analysis of the origins of the country uh, in 1776, where uh, we argue that there was the possibility of choosing to develop a new nation that was a nation that was free of slavery. And that choice was not made. Instead, the United States became a slave republic. Uh, we also point out that uh, it was possible to uh, eliminate slavery without conducting a civil war. Mm. Uh, and we talk in chapter five of the book at length about the option of compensated emancipation. And that is, you know, th this, 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 this may sound uh, a little bit uh, perverse, uh, but if you think about it as an alternative to having uh, engaged in a war that cost upwards of 700,000 lives, uh, one thing that could have been done, and it was proposed time and again, uh, but always rejected by uh, the Southern slaveholders, uh, was to actually pay them mm. a sum of money per enslaved human being to uh, emancipate those persons. So bring about an end to slavery, but do it by paying the slaveholders off. Um, and, uh, and the slaveholders were never willing to seriously consider that option. So the nation goes to war, uh, it is a civil war that takes place where I think that the contribution of black soldiers, black support personnel to the Union Army is something that is grievously underestimated. Right. It's not a case in which black freedom was a gift that was given to black folks. Uh, black folks were actively involved in the process of liberation associated with the Union Army's efforts to win the war. Uh, but in the aftermath, uh, there was a possibility of conducting a true reconstruction policy where uh, black folks could have been fully included in the electorate and uh, where black folks could have received substantial tracts of land as restitution. And neither of those things happened. Instead, there was a white terror campaign that resulted in the restoration of conditions throughout the South that were as similar to slavery as the uh, white authorities could possibly make them. And so there's another fork in the road that was lost. Uh, final significant fork in the road that I'd like to mention, and, and there are more, but uh, was, was the way in which home ownership policy was crafted in the 20th century. Mm. Uh, and home ownership policy was designed in the 20th century to provide upward mobility or to create a, a, an extensive uh, middle class in the United States. A white middle class. Uh, exactly right. A white middle class because uh, there were systematic uh, efforts to exclude blacks from having access to the same opportunities to become home buyers. And this, this begins with restrictive covenants. It carries through with the policies of redlining. It's present in the way in which the New Deal legislation was designed to exclude blacks. Uh, and it's also present in the way in which the GI Bill was written so that there was decentralized authority over its administration, which meant that local authorities could at their own discretion exclude black black veterans from receiving the benefits. Uh, and, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, there was an extensive process of excluding blacks from receiving the benefits, particularly the benefits that were associated with subsidies for home ownership. Deliberate, systemic, strategic, thought out, not some ranting hillbilly in front of a Walmart or a Dollar General yelling out expletives in the N-word. We're talking about well-to-do white men in suits, uh, elected officials deciding 
the outcome for black people to be dire. So when we have these conversations and people make these these claims, they, they're always coming from a position of, of uh, it, well, they tend to come from a position of the individual. Um, you know, everyone's not racist. We're talking about system, systemic racism, which is a totally different animal altogether. And, and I, once again, um, I've learned that a lot of people don't understand. They just have not been informed. It's not taught in the school, doctor. They, they, they're not, you know, on your Twitter timeline. They should be. And, and they're not aware of these things. And, and, and then I get to deal with them every Tuesday and Friday night when they call the show and say the dumbest things, the most ignorant things about black people is if black people chose the situation. Tim. Hey. Is that me? Hey. Yes, sir. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. Who's this? Uh, my name is Bill, and I'm from uh, Georgia. And I got to give a shout out to uh, Spencer, a 32 year old engineer. You know why he's an engineer? Because he didn't buy into the Democratic lie that black people are victims. <laughs> he knew that if he puts work in, he could become an engineer. You know why you're. Because you didn't buy into the lie. That is the biggest lie perpetrated against the black people in America, and it's by the Democrats that you all are victims. You guys can succeed when black people stand up and they say, I want to be an engineer. They can do it. In America, they can do it. A black man says, I want to be president of the United States. He can do it. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say, Tim. It's a lie. It's a lie Bill. by the media. Bill. It's a lie by the Democrats. Bill. Yes, sir. You are ignorant as fuck. Yes, sir. You are ignorant as fuck. Why are you going to say that, Tim? Because it's the truth, Bill. I can't lie to you, man. I'm an American of Italian descent. So, but now, as I watch Black Lives Matter talk about, you know, all these white people and everything, I'd just like to give a little history lesson because, you know, during the Civil War, there was a lot of Irish that came over here. And as soon as they got off the boat, they were signed up right for the Civil War, and they went and died to help free slaves. And I would also like to add that we've never had an Italian president. They said that we would never respect America. We would only take orders from the Vatican. Um, they've made the RICO law specifically for us Italians. So I just... Um, think that the Black Lives Matter organization and, uh, you know, this young generation um, do themselves a disservice when they generalize everybody. <laughs> and uh, aye, I, aye, I try aye, to be aye, an ally. Aye, 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 aye. Um, I have to add this. I have to ask you this because, and this is yeah. going to be, it's going to sound crazy. Anybody black out there who gets this question about Irish slavery? Dr. Darity, could you once and for all, if I was a white man just asking this question, well, what about Irish? The Irish were slaves. Without you, without cursing me out, because I don't think you use that type of language anyway. What would, <laughs> how would you put me in my place? People, listen closely to Dr. Darity on this response. I, I would like, I would invite people, okay, you know, there, there's a selfish motive here. I would love people to get our book, okay? <laughs> well, that's cool, that's great, that's great. But, but on, on, on page 67 of our book, we say the following, and I think, uh, I, I'd like to read this, if I may. Please, sir. Okay. Black people overwhelmingly were the objects of enslavement. While there was an extended period of white immigrant indentured servitude during the colonial period, their numbers were dwarfed by coerced immigrants from the African continent. Even at the height of importation of white indentures, while 216,000 whites came to British North America as bonded laborers, 300,000 Africans were forcibly imported to the colonies. By the time of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the practice of white indentureship was in sharp decline. On the other hand, by 1790, there were close to 700,000 enslaved blacks in the United States, a number that grew to 4 million by the start of the Civil War. 
Moreover, black enslavement had a unique severity that obviates any equivalence that might be drawn to white indentured servitude. As historian Dominic Sandbrook observes, it was almost always better to be a European servant than an African slave. Not only were servants transported in better conditions, they could also hope to be free men if they survived their term of service. Above all, they were white, which meant that they were automatically different from the West African slaves. As the servants would have pointed out, the racial codes of the American colonies were a lot more than window dressing. Calling them slaves might be a marketing ploy, but it stretches the meaning of slavery beyond breaking point. One of the eventual beneficiaries of the relatively advantaged position of white indentures appears to be actor and country music star Reba McIntyre. Unlike enslaved blacks who could not obtain rights and land under any circumstances, after the 1660s in Virginia, indentures were given grants of land or could purchase land on credit. This was known as the headright system. No relatives are known to have accompanied nine-year-old George Brassfield, six generations removed from McIntyre, on his passage from England to colonial Virginia. Brassfield was contracted out to work for a tobacco farmer in Essex County, Virginia, and he completed his indenture by 1710. Mm. Via the headright system, he was able to purchase 300 acres of land with 1,600 pounds of tobacco in 1721. By 1819, less than a century later, his grandson and namesake, George Brassfield, born in 1765, owned 1,615 acres of land and 10 slaves in North Carolina, and also was the owner of record of the Brassfield Tavern. The headright system always had been implemented with severe limitations on the participation of enslaved blacks that did not extend to indentured whites and it laid the foundation for the wealth of George Brassfield and his descendants. Wow. Wow. There you go. And now, now, that's a lot to remember to say in response to these, these questions. But I, I'm just impressed that that question wasn't that crazy because you actually put it in your book. So, so that means it is a question that others have asked and you felt it was worth uh, addressing it in the book. Yeah, and in fact, there's a chapter in the book, chapter 12, where we identify a set of questions that people normally ask, and we try to answer them. Excellent book, man. Sounds like an excellent book. Where, where, where can people pick it up? I'm going to put a picture of it up here for folks when I put the video out, Doctor. but uh, where would they get it? Amazon or other bookstores? Yeah, a Amazon is, is as good a place as any to, to okay. try to get it. Yeah, but they can, they can purchase it wherever books are sold. But uh, Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, 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 Doc, is there, is there anything I'm, I'm leaving out? Is there any other uh, uh, topic you'd like to address? Or you you know what's going on out here. We got Brianna Taylor's The Murder. Um, um, how would reparations or play for reparations uh, feed into, you know, social issues like, you know, cops killing us in the streets? Uh, um, you know, uh, the, what we're seeing with these juries that can't come back with a with uh, convictions for cops or even indictments for, for police officers uh, at the prosecutor level. what How would that play in reparations? Is there, is there uh, I don't know, a way to get there? Because we need more than just stuff because they'll just take the stuff from us. We need more than just money because th they'll just shoot us in the streets. What's, what, what do you, you know, see for that, for these issues? So I, I, I think of reparations as creating an opportunity to provide us with some form of restitution for all the atrocities that we've experienced. But I don't see reparations as having the capacity in and of itself uh, to eliminate any black police violence. Uh, so so let, let, me, let me be clear. I, I don't think that reparations can solve all of the problems. Mm. Uh, and, and as I said, there's a difference between pulling the knife out and healing the wound. Reparations can help us heal the wound, but there are other steps that need to be taken to pull the knife out. And, and ending anti-black violence is a form of pulling the knife out. Okay. 
uh, and uh, and that would require things like eliminating qualified immunity. It would require changing the incentives that police are faced with so that if, in fact, they commit crimes, they will have to pay the penalty directly themselves. Right. Uh, because, you know, the, 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 the settlement for Breonna Taylor, none of that's coming out of the pockets of the individuals who actually killed her. Uh, and so uh, that's 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 uh, that's that's a different set of policies from the policies that are associated with a reparations plan. So we need both. Uh, we need both to pull the knife out and we need to heal the wound. Uh, but our book is primarily about what steps can be taken to heal the wound. Amazing work, amazing conversation, Dr. Darity. I appreciate you so much. Take your time out once again and sharing with us. Uh, where will people go to find out more about you and, and to follow your work? Uh, they can uh, they can follow me on Twitter, uh, at Sandy Darity. Uh, they can also go to uh, the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center's website and look at our publications and our news reports. Uh, which uh, contain a lot of the uh, materials that I've worked on, that I've worked on collaboratively uh, with a number of scholars. And uh, in addition to looking for our book, I would encourage them to look for the report that will come from the Reparations Planning Commission, mm. hopefully uh, sometime in the first half of 2020, 2021. I just want to add, no disrespect to the Reparations Planning Commission. I didn't mean to to, to say that you guys weren't, uh, that this was a unilateral uh, commission written, you know, driven by one individual or just, uh, it's yeah. my mistake. <laughs> Thank you once again, Dr. Gerdy, for, for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. And right now is the time. I think we should, we should all voices, all, everybody should, uh, do what they can to get the word out and, and put some pressure on our lawmakers to make this happen. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on. So it's, uh, it's a great program, and I really enjoy talking to you. Thanks, brother. All right, folks, thank you for watching this video, and please share it with a friend. And don't forget, pick up the book by Dr. William A. Darity Jr. and A. Kirsten Mullet. From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. That book will be wherever good books are sold. Also, don't forget to become a Patreon for the Tim Black Show at Patreon.com. Tim's Take Live. Your support keeps that content rolling. Wolfpack.